Podcasting from Singapore and broadcasting all around the world. You're listening to the Ignite EdTech Podcast with Craig Kemp, created by an educator for educators and streaming to the world. Now, over to your host, Craig Kemp. Hello and welcome to episode 82 of the Ignite EdTech Podcast. I'm your host, Craig Kemp, and I'm honored to have you join us. As most of you know, I continue to work with the incredibly talented Mark Quinn to improve the final audio quality of this podcast. He has his own podcast production studio that provides editing and mastering services to content creators. To connect with Mark, please see the details in the podcast notes below. Last week, I asked you about where you go to for your own professional learning and why. Thank you for your thoughts and ideas. This week, I wanted to ask about conferences and events. What do you love about these experiences? And what do you dislike? We've had so much change over the past two years. In your mind, what is the perfect learning experience? I'd love to hear from you. Please share with us via our Ignite EdTech social streams. I look forward to hearing your responses soon. A tool that has positively impacted the authentic and purposeful use of technology into classrooms and meeting rooms that I have worked in is GoBubble. GoBubble is your classroom safer social media. The fun way to connect, communicate, and collaborate in your very own social media and connect with more than 3,500 registered schools all over the world. GoBubble shares that their platform has proven to boost kindness, reduce bullying, and make learning fun for everyone in a K-12 environment. GoBubble promotes safety and well-being. Their technology checks all content, chat, photos, and videos before it appears, providing a safer way for teachers and students to connect and collaborate. Students and teachers can post conversations as bubbles where they can upload text, photos, videos, or links, or even create polls. Some classroom uses include asking students to lead a discussion around content learned in class, describing their own digital footprint, or explaining how they would spread kindness in their lives. Teachers can also use the program to conduct competitions or have students collaborate on projects, join a discussion group such as the Global Thankfulness Project, which shares photos, videos, and comments on ways students demonstrate gratitude. The best part is that GoBubble is free for schools, so it's worthwhile exploring and seeing if it fits within the context of your school. I highly recommend that you take a look at gobubble.school. The link is in the description below. Last week, we talked about ways to be more collaborative in a tech-rich classroom. If you're interested in learning more, go back and listen to last week's episode. This week, I wanted to talk about parent education with EdTech in your school. This week, I was asked in an interview my thoughts on social media in schools and how to educate the greater school community. This, of course, led me to want to share GoBubble as a resource for schools, but I also wanted to go through my thoughts on this topic here too. Having worked in multiple school environments, both public and private, across multiple curriculums and countries, I've seen it all when it comes to parent education around technology and learning. As a technology and innovation director, one of the most common questions was related to screen time, quickly followed by social media and its use by kids of various ages. My answer to parents was always that you know your kids best. Be a parent. And it always referred them back to Common Sense Media and the American Academy of Pediatrics, who have detailed research and study banks into these areas. I feel that parent education programs around tech use and social media are generally lacking in our school communities, and this almost always comes down to a lack of confidence in building tech-rich learning experiences for the wider school community, and the time that has to be dedicated to this by school teachers or leaders to be able to run these extensive learning experiences. One of the best ways I've seen to combat these is by using one of the most powerful learning experiences that I've ever seen in this space. And that's by running topics like social media and your teen. This is what we did in my last school. A partnership between school counsellors that included middle school and high school students in a space 
where they got to share their messages from their perspective. These critically important topics were chosen by the students, and they included things that we often shy away from, like sexting, social media use, social dating sites, instant communication apps, and much more. The transparency in this space was incredible, and the comfortable sharing environment that we created established and demonstrated the power of this learning environment. Some basic rules were established, like parents couldn't go to the same table as their child unless it was agreed upon, and it was okay. Everyone had to be willing to be open and honest, and nothing personal left the room. It was an incredible experience that was replicated twice a year and still continues today in a virtual space in the school with great success. Build a culture of transparency and honest sharing and the benefits will come quickly. Another core component of a solid parent education program with EdTech is opening up to parent questions, concerns and thoughts and addressing these in a transparent and open forum, whether that's virtual or face to face. Having parents co-construct these rules, regulations, and learning opportunities in relation to EdTech brings the community closer together, and it helps break down barriers between parents and their children. We have to remember that parents in our schools are not digital natives, and our kids know more than we do, and that's okay. Move beyond the giant walls, break them down, and build transparent learning programs around technology and its use both in and out of school. Build confidence and competence in your parent community and you'll be rewarded with a rich tech environment where learning can continue beyond the school gates and messages are supported and endorsed on every level. I'd love to hear from you to learn more about technology education for your school community and what you do. Please reach out with your ideas and thoughts. Every week I bring you a short interview with some of my edu heroes, an engaging learning experience with someone who makes a difference in education every day, with a particular focus or angle towards educational technology. This week, I had the pleasure of chatting with Yong Zhao. Let's have a listen to the chat. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Yong Zhao, who's an inspirational leader and distinguished professor of education at the University of Canvas and a professor in educational leadership at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education in Australia. He previously served as the Presidential Chair, Associate Dean, and Director of the Institute for Global and Online Education in the College of Education at the University of Oregon, where he was also a professor in the Department of Educational Measurement, Policy, and Leadership. Yong has received numerous awards, including the Early Career Award for the American Educational Research Association, Outstanding Public Educator from Horace Mann League of USA, and Distinguished Achievement Award in Professional Development from the Association of Education Publishers. He's been recognized as one of the most influential education scholars. His work focuses on the implications of globalization and technology on education, He's published over 100 articles and 30 books. Professor Yong Zhao has a course on eduspark.world, which is an inspiring conversation about the world of education and based on the concept of how to fix schools in an ever-changing world. Yong, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Are you ready to talk about education and technology integration? Of course, Craig. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. Let's go. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your current role and what inspires you to do what you do? Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm a professor uh, at the University of Kansas uh, and also professor at the University of Melbourne. In basic, I'm doing this job in two countries. You know, most of my, my work right now really focuses on writing, research, supervising students and teaching courses. And this just uh, allows me to really explore new ideas, new possibilities, allows me to think about, you know, what's wrong with education, what we can do to fix it, and what we can do to help our children grow into productive and happy citizens. Yeah, and I, I love that. And I love the way you talk about, you know, kids first. And I think that's a hugely important element that, you know, in the day-to-day -day busyness of our lives, we often forget about. And you work across, as you said, 
two different, completely different parts of the world as a professor in both the US and Australia. What inspires you to lead learning that is so diverse? Well, I mean, thank you so much. I, you know, I, I was uh, born and raised in a tiny village in China. And so I, I taught in China as well. I also was a visiting professor in England. I just always have this uh, uh, fascination with uh, education, communities, and cultures in different places. So I've always tried to learn as much from colleagues in different places, but also trying to contribute you know, uh, the different uh, ideas across cultures. So I'm uh, always viewing myself right now as a, as a global citizen in many ways to say how I can contribute to the, the global effort to make education, make schools better for our children. Yeah, and in that note, you know, you have a course on edusparc.world uh, and the, the work that you do in that course and program is all around, you know, how do we help people in their schools be better at what they do? Uh, how do we fight the key issues that are facing education, schooling, school initiatives, professional learning, uh, and really deep diving into the challenges that face education today? Tell us a little bit about the course, why our listeners should jump on and explore this. Well, I mean, I think, you know, uh, I really think there are two big, big problems in education and almost all education reforms are doing the wrong thing. They are trying to fix the wrong thing. The two big problems is number one, we don't know what we're measuring. Everybody's trying to measure education outcomes, but we have so many different education outcomes. What you measure, what you record is what students learn in that course. But that does not measure, you know, if the student is getting more creative, students is getting more engaged, students happy, students become more self-determined. You know, we always confuse the short-term instructional goals with long-term educational goals. And uh, we also neglect, you know, when you assess students, you assess them against a set of the same standard, the same kind of criteria, what we need to do is to help every student to develop a jagged profile to become unique, great thinkers. So that's the first thing we need to rethink about how we measure and how we assess. And the second thing is we fail to recognize students as partners of change, as owners of their own learning and teachers, uh, policy makers, system makers, we're all there to help students grow into, again, productive, contributing citizens of the world who can have a happy life in serving other people. Yeah, and it's a fantastic point. And in the course, you dive deep into this as well. You know, one of the big questions that strikes me is how? How do we make this change now in what I think is probably one of the most critical times in the history of education, you know, and probably one of the best times to actually make change as we start to reach um, the new normal of this pandemic. How do we make that change uh, on a granular level all over the world, Yong? You know, Craig, I, I got that question all the time. Everybody says, ask me how. You know, in my mind, the how actually is in everyone's mind. I mean, I think as parents, as educators, as policy makers, we always know that we're not measuring exactly the right things. We're not treating our students as owners of learning. I think we have been confined by the concept of schooling. You know, in a school, you must have a curriculum that treats everybody the same. You, you test them the same way. You force teachers to teach according to the curriculum. You do not allow students to have any room to be themselves. You know, you know we know that we need to change that because education has been enslaved by schools. And schools as an institution, you know, do not necessarily reflect on how we should educate. So I think the how is with every educator, is with us. I think systems control too much of what we can do, what students can be, and what education can, can be as well. We need to really remove our temp the temptation to control people, to always try to tell others what to do. We need to really rethink about the process of growing. I mean, today, especially, like you said, after COVID, you know, we are still during COVID-19, um, but 
you know, we, we're using more technology. Today, we truly have a global uh, learning environment. If we permit our students to enjoy that, if we give our poor children access to those tools, and I think we can completely change education. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, to dive into that a little bit more, you know, I'm thinking of the people listening to this, maybe a teacher in a classroom in Australia or a school leader uh, in a small public school in Vietnam or a, a middle leader in a large international school in Singapore. What's something that, as they listen to this, that they can take away and start to garner some immediate change within their school building tomorrow? Oh, there are a lot of things they can do. For example, you could go back to, by the way, ask your students to say, what are you interested in learning? And it will supply some of that. You can ask the students, what's your passion? What would you like to do? What problems would you like to solve? Then we can create resource for them. You can also create online global learning opportunities using technology to have your students to be engaged with people from South America, from uh, Africa, from China, from the U.S., from anywhere. You know, those opportunities all exist if we just kept open our eyes. And also we can ask our teachers to teach less. You know, maybe we can also take a look at our curriculum. Do we need to spend all the time teaching the same thing? Or can we ask our students to say what I call, can we build a strength profile that the strength profile would uh, go to students, what they're good at, what they're interested in, and we'll build resources to support that. Yeah, fantastic. And, you know, this really resonates well with me. A lot of the work we're doing in EduSpark is talking around, you know, learning is where the work is. So who's doing the work? You know, what's the conversation? Do we have a a stand and deliver teacher at the front of the classroom or, or room or space or, you know, what's actually happening in conversation and communities of practice to change and develop that learning process. So fantastic points, Yong. As you think about your next big goals in your career, you've already achieved so much, but is there something that you want to do or achieve that you haven't been able to do yet? Well, education change is a long journey, you know, you know, if you look at schools now, many schools are innovative, many educators are innovative, many students are innovative. They're trying to change. They are working very hard. Uh, I am really uh, working actually on about four books at this moment, really. Most of them have a lot to do with uh, what we can do. You know, one book we just published called uh, um, uh, Learning for Uncertainty, just, pop just came out at Routledge uh, a few days ago is really talk about how the future is so different and it's filled with uncertainty, but our schools are teaching subjects as if we know what the future is. So that book helps. You know, I'm also uh, just finishing up uh, a memoir of my life. You know, uh, you know, it's called Improbable Probabilities to try to help kids in poor and disadvantaged area to understand how you can escape from the probability you're born into. Because I was born without you know, much probability of doing much at all in, in a rural areas and very poor. But, I, but, the, but you know, my memoir, this book is not written about me. It is written about how we recognize opportunities, how we see the world as filled with opportunities rather than filled with uh, disappointing you know, nightmares. You know, that, that's something. You know, I'm also we're working on the book about uh, for parents, about self-determination, how parents can help, can create an environment to help their students, their children to become self-determined, to become autonomous. So there are a lot of things we can do. I'm also doing a lot more work with the, uh, with a lot of schools to talk about it. I'm going to San Francisco, actually, in a couple of days to speak at the, the Learning and the Brain Conference, talk about uh, what we can do. So I, I'm still thinking about I'm doing messaging, doing understanding. And I think uh, I'm excited, really, mostly about is to understand uh, ourselves as learners, to understand the environment as context, and to understand how we interact with the context. So there's a lot of work, Craig, in lots of things. Yeah, I, I love that. Really inspirational work, too, and not just scratching the surface, but diving deep. And that's uh, really exciting to hear the change that's happening as well. And Hopefully one day you'll be over in this part of the world too once we get rid of this 
this virus and we can travel freely and, and learn and grow together. As we dive now into some quick fire questions, Yong, I just want you to think of the first thing that comes to your head and maybe a really brief why. What is your hashtag one word for 2022? Hope. I'm a one person who always has hope. Uh, I think in education, the thing we always take away from children is hope. We teach them, we tell them they're not good at this, not good at that, you know, but we, we take away their hope. If you have hope, you will want to learn. If you have hope, you're curious. If you're curious, you are constant learning. If you are learning, you're enriching yourself and you're making contribution to other people. So learning for a purpose and the purpose connects with your hope. What is your favorite EdTech book or resource, Yong? Well, I actually wrote a book uh, on EdTech. I think that's my favorite. If you want, I, I think everyone should read it. It's called uh, uh, Never Send a Human to Do a Machine's Job. It's a really a, 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 a third year reflection of educational technology. Uh, it, it is about... Uh, how human beings have been doing technical jobs that can be done by machines. So I took that right in line from the movie, The Matrix, never seen a human to do a machine's job. I love it. We'll make sure the link to that uh, is in the podcast notes below as well. What's your go-to ed tech tool that the listeners need to try? Uh, I don't have one, but I want to uh, alert you and your listeners to our ed tech show is called Silver Lining for Learning. And it is a TV show we do every Saturday. We bring speakers, practitioners, school leaders, policymakers, you know, influential people like Tony Wagner, Paz Sauberg, a lot of people to the show. We've done 93 episodes, and you can find this at Silver Lining for Learning. Dot .org you know it's all archived and it, it is a really powerful show and i co-host that with uh, chris Didi. i'm sure you know at tech uh, education technology professor from harvard uh, with kurt bunk another education technology uh, professor from indiana university and also punia mishra uh, you know a, a professor and associate dean at the arizona state university yeah amazing we'll make sure the link to that is in the podcast notes below as well i love it definitely going to be jumping into that archive what is one daily habit or practice that helps you enjoy progress and succeed in your career well i have to write almost every day i have to i have to do some writing whether i'm successful in writing anything that day or not I just cannot let a day go without doing some writing and thinking. Yeah, that's it's a really cool habit to have. And I can see that uh, in the numerous books you've written as well. And we'll list a lot of those uh, in the podcast notes. Yong, this has been amazing. What's the best way for the listeners to follow and connect with you? Well, they can follow me on Twitter. It's uh, Y-O-N-G-Z-H-A-O-E-D. Or you can just uh, get on my website. You can provide a link called zaolearning.com. Z-H-A-O learning.com. Thank you so much for your time today, Yong. Inspirational as always. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Lovely talking to you. Next week, join me for episode 83 of the Ignite EdTech podcast, when I'm joined by the inspirational Nancy Squicherini. Want to win a prize? Enter now at bit.ly slash edtechwin and we'll regularly announce winners of incredible prizes. If you enjoyed today's episode, please follow us and share the podcast with your PLN and colleagues. Please remember to spend a few minutes to rate this podcast too on your podcast channel of choice so we can reach even more educators and edtech enthusiasts globally. Remember, you have the chance to win as well. Check out the links in the description for more and I'll see you again next week. If you liked today's episode, please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss another episode and be in the drawing to win prizes every week. If you know others that would enjoy the show, please hit that share button and brighten their day. Join us again next week for your weekly EdTech hit with at Mr. Kemp NZ. We'll see you again soon.